Welcome to Old Guy Tech. The OGT.TV recording studio. Technology for the rest of us. 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 Hey, this is Rob with Old Guy Tech TV News 44, and today we get an opportunity to talk to Dave Pratt, who is running for supervisor in District 2 under the special uh, district election that's coming up because uh, a current sitting supervisor uh, was removed from his seat. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Board of Supervisors has decided uh, that they're going to go hold a special election to fill that seat. Dave, let me ask you really quick on that seat. How does that uh, how does that work? Uh, you know, you get elected, and then what happens? You're good for until November, or we uh, oh, you fill out his you fill, you fill out the rest seat. you fill out the rest of the term, right? Um, and so it would be seated immediately, right? Upon the results of the election being confirmed, and then you would fill out just a little over two years. Uh, as part of that term. Okay, good. Well, listen, folks, I, I want to make sure that we get a good introduction because my, my question led to a question. But first of all, I want to thank you, Dave, very much for coming in and uh, being part of Old Guy Tech TV here. And um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running and, and all those kind of good things. Sure. Uh, my name is Dave Pratt, and uh, I'm a winemaker, a grape grower, a uh, small business person, and uh, a community volunteer. I've, uh, I've been sitting the past uh, almost six years on the Planning Commission as uh, representing the constituents of uh, District 2. Um, I wasn't sure where, how I was going to get started in this process, but I, um, 12 years ago I started working on the general plan uh, as a representative uh, mm -hmm. for the Grape Growers Association, uh, of which I was president. Um, that led to uh, an appointment to the Agricultural Commission, mm -hmm. and uh, and then after that, uh, when uh, Ray was elected in uh, 2008, uh, in 2009, I became uh, his appointee to the Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've uh, so I've been working with uh, government-related processes for a dozen years at this stage of the game, and I think. Um, I think that's a lot of experience that uh, that can be leveraged moving forward to the Board of Supervisors. Oh, absolutely. Uh, anytime that we get uh, anybody with some experience, what happens is, and not tooting my horn, but I've been on the grand jury, I've been chairman uh, on the Transportation Commission, I've been chairman of the Transit Authority, I've been chairman of Fish and Game Commission. You need to garner some, some experience, my feeling, for people that, mm -hmm. you know, you guys out there wanting to run, you know, God bless you for wanting to run, but I think it helps a lot when you have some experience as to how a board works, Robert's Rules of Order, the Brown Act, all those type of things. Yeah, it's a different it's a different world. I you know I started as uh, you know speaking from the dais and uh, and testifying on different elements and uh, and items that were uh, being pondered as to be included into the general plan process. But it is a different world when you uh, when you're sitting on the panel itself. Uh, you have the microphone in front of you. You get to ask the uh, 101 questions, and I do ask a lot of questions. That's, right. that's kind of my hallmark. Um, and then you got to make a decision. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're trying to you're trying to get to the best uh, result possible for the for the greatest number of folks, and uh, that's not an easy process. You have to do it a little bit in order to have some comfort level. With sure. It. Absolutely. You know, and it's, and it's also no, knowing the right questions to ask. I mean, if you have knowledge of the county, uh, and you, uh, if you've been in the county most of your life, or? I've lived, uh, we've, my wife and I have lived in El Dorado County for just over 25 years. Yeah, good. Um, uh, We moved to, uh, we started in Cameron Park. We mm -hmm. lived in Cameron Park for three and a half years, and then we moved a little farther up uh, Highway 50. Uh, we were both working in corporate America at that mm -hmm. stage of the game. Um, and I would say, you know, my, my work career started as a technical, from a technical basis. Uh, and then I uh, moved into uh, management positions and supervisory roles. Um, I ended up in uh, the sales department and doing uh, marketing alliances and strategic things, uh, strategic relationships. Um, and, and so I, I feel like that when I put those things together, when I take my work life uh, career and then apply it to what I've been doing in the, in the county for the last 12 years. Right. Um, you know, it's the same. It's the same evolution. It's uh, it's technical to administrative to strategic, and I and I believe that that's uh, that's my advantage as a candidate. 
Yeah, um, it, it's it's important that you have an outage. District 2 is kind of an odd duck. Why don't you explain to our viewers out there exactly what District 2 is? Yeah, District 2 is a, a very large and diverse district. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it starts up near uh, Jenkins' Lake, Sly Park area. In that, that neighborhood, mm -hmm. kind of comes down into the South County, uh, Pleasant Valley, Somerset, Monarch, and Fair Play. Uh, kind of continues along uh, Pleasant Valley Road and then uh, dips around Diamond Springs and El Dorado, comes back up uh, near Greenstone on Mother Load, and then it's kind of south from there um, until we get to uh, Cameron Park. And it takes what I'm calling the heart of Cameron Park. It's, right. it's, it's uh, goes up uh, Cameron Park Drive, Green Valley Road, Bass Lake, and kind of works its way over uh, back down to 50 and then south into Latrobe. Yeah. So it's, there's a lot. I mean, you have agriculture, you have uh, suburbia, if you want yeah. to call Cameron yeah. Park suburbia of sorts. Uh, so there's a very diverse range of uh, issues and needs out there. Th there really are. And it, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, what do you feel are the top couple of needs that are not being met in District 2? Well, I think... Um, I'm, I'm interested in this uh, community identity piece. There's a component in the general plan that talks about you know, uh, communities uh, developing their own community identity. And um, we're just starting to scratch the surface of that one right now. Uh, there's some groups that have gotten organized uh, for that, but it takes, um, it takes a lot of thought and input. And how do you take that input and turn it into a plan? And then how do you get consensus on mm -hmm. that? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, having... Uh, you know, having five percent of the of the population base participate in that is is a start, but how do you get the other ninety five percent to contribute to it too? And I, I so I think there's a process that's going to require some thoughtful conversation in order to, to to fully flesh it out. But I'm really excited, and I really believe that it's an important part of of setting the tone uh, for the upcoming uh, decades for El Dorado County by having this community identity piece. And I think that's a driving factor in a lot of areas. So um, <clears throat> are, I, when you're calling a community identif identification piece, is this basically a community uh, meeting where people get together and identify yeah, problems? See, I think that's, or what, what is it? Well, I think, that's where the, um, I think that's where the discussion is. It's more about, you know, what do we want our community to look like? What does it right. need to look like from, a, uh, from an aesthetics and an and a exterior perspective? What does the composition of it need to be? You know, do, do we want, you know, how many more parks do we want to have? Do we want parks? Do we want, uh, are we rural? Um, what, are, uh, what are our business needs, yeah. right? What are our services that we're looking for? So I, I think it's, uh, it almost goes back to what, uh, you know, try to avoid jargon, but it goes almost goes back to the, the, uh, the area plans from uh, general plans in the past. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the 70s, there was a, a push on area plans. And I think that uh, this is a, a chance to kind of embrace some of those pieces as well as incorporate it into the general plan. You know, uh, again, as you said, the District 2 is so diverse. Um, does that include the Cameron Park Airport? It does. It does. So you have a whole issue there. You know, one of the problems, and, and unfortunately I didn't bring the map up so people could see District 2, um, it, it really is an odd realignment due to the census and the way it works and the way it's laid out. And um, so one of the things we have, we have from... Uh, high density as far as uh, apartment uh, complexes there. Some, there's some. Some condos. Mm -hmm. We have an airport. We do. Or two, uh, depending. Uh, right. you know. Uh, and then as you keep moving up uh, Highway 50, you have uh, all those needs there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so do you think um, that these residents have had an opportunity to get their voices heard, or do you feel like it's just been politics as usual? Well, I think, uh, you know, this is where, this is the exciting part of the process, is that you know, having participated in the general plan process, I know who was in the room at, at, in those, uh, in that time frame. Um, there's another wave of folks that have become engaged and involved, and I, mm -hmm. and I think that's, I think that's great. I think it's, it's really exciting. Now we have to try to uh, bring all those thoughts together and uh, build some consensus behind uh, items and issues and, and needs, and then and then turn that into that that overriding piece, so that uh, the, the global overlay for 
a Cameron Park or a Shingle Springs or even the South County. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's going to be diverse, and, we're, and it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution for everyone. No. There's no way. It, yeah, there, there isn't any way. Um, you know, it's not like you're sitting in, in the county of Los Angeles, and you can take a look at what they're doing. Right. They're, you know, they're boxed in. It's a, it's a whole different area for uh, those of us here in, in uh, El Dorado County because we, again, you said it's so diverse. And uh, what I, I guess I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, is I'm trying to identify what other a couple of major concerns that the, the community as a whole has moving forward. Yeah, I, you know, I'm going to say um, I'm involved with the Fire Safe Council in Pleasant Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we just celebrated our first anniversary. I've been uh, actively uh, attending all the Grizzly Flats uh, Fire Safe right. Council meetings over the last, basically for the last year as well. Part of it's because Part of it's because it's in my neighborhood, and part of it's because we were starting to work on the Pleasant Valley side of it. Right. But there's a there's a big push out there right now. I mean, people are scared about what happened down south, and the Rim Fire, and um, and here we are on the you know kind of on an interface point with uh, with wilderness areas. Right. So, I mean, even in Cameron Park, there was discussions about how it's it's deemed one of the more uh, fire safe challenge areas in the state you know right behind oakland hills yeah. so yeah. I, I think there's a chance to use that as a catalyst for for creating some of that community identity starts these community associations so that they they have a place and a mechanism to uh voice some of their concerns and also start working together and build some uh, camaraderie I, I think that um when we take a when we take a look at some of the things that have been happening over the past year and a half at the board level um, I think there's more, there's conversations at each other, there's not conversations with each other. Okay. And I think having a, a base of, of understanding and a, and a common goal uh, on something that's, uh, that virtually everyone can agree upon is a fantastic starting point for that community identity and, and those community conversations that need right. to take place. So, um, <clears throat> so I, I would have to agree that I think fire is right up there. I think all of us that live in this partially rural area uh, have a lot of concerns on that so that's definitely something that needs to be uh, ad addressed and taken care of um, what about um, the, you know the normal stuff that a county normally takes care of uh, are we addressing the needs of roads are we addressing needs of access do we have issues on right-of-ways do we have you know major hot-button topics yeah I, I think we have a couple on let's talk about the roads real quick um, I think there's a couple things that go in here uh, from the rural side of the house, we are um, we need to have a very comprehensive road maintenance program. Yeah. Um, you know, we have billions of dollars invested in our road network, and a lot of them are rural. Um, do we have a maintenance program? Are we gonna, you know, are we doing the top dressings and, and chip seals? Are we building up the shoulders? Are we? Do we have something that's happening on a regular basis so right. that we're not? Um, so we're just not dealing doing it every 10 years whether we need to or not but right. actually have a, a plan to protect that investment mm -hmm. so we have to have some allocation of dollars to expand that um as in a lot of things with the county uh resources have been pared back because of the budget constraints coming across the last five mm -hmm. years we have to pursue financial grants and other programs to allow us to take care of those pieces the second part of that is is snow removal um with a limited number of, of maintenance crews that are out there, and we have we do have these low snow events that that creates uh, creates chaos. Yeah, um, they're going to serve the higher density populations first. first right. But it doesn't mean that there isn't a need to get the roads plowed out in the out in the country. Those folks have to go to work. Oh yeah, they have family issues that they have to address, and the sooner we get the plow on the road. The less ice we have, the less people are less opportunities for people to end up in the ditch, mm -hmm. and, and all those things that happen out there. Some of us just sit and wait. Um, I have a business out there. Um, you know, people always like to come up and see the snow on the vineyards and, and the like. That's right. Yeah. But if they can't get there, it doesn't help us to. Doesn't do you any good. Doesn't does do us it? any good. So, yeah. so I think from a uh, from an overall road maintenance perspective, we've got a couple things we need to address out there, in the in the back country and the high in the higher country. Mm -hmm. um, in in other areas, it's about circulation. We don't have um, 
I'm not sure that we have a, a, a fully blown strategy that's viable for circulation in areas like Cameron Park. Um, you know, the, the choke point in Cameron Park is the underpass at Cameron Park Drive and Highway 50. Um, there is no way to get to the south side of the freeway without being on the freeway or going through the neck of the hourglass. There. Right. right. And, and the other part of it is old, old roads were put in and people are at the ends of those roads. Tying back in with fire safe, we need to be able to connect those roads, at least on an emergency basis, so we don't have any unfortunate situations where someone is stuck in a spot where they cannot get out. Um, you know, there's this conversation about uh, a concept called complete streets, which is bicycles and, and sidewalks. I mean, we need to work on connected streets mm -hmm. and connected roads in order to ensure public safety as well as uh, as well as an avenue so that we can uh, create that circulation that we desperately need. Yeah, absolutely. If we can't get emergency personnel out into these areas uh, during these events or just because the road conditions are so bad, we have a major problem and we're absolutely. not serv serving our citizens very well. No, we're not. Yeah, so, so we, that, that's a good one. So we definitely need to take a look at uh, DOT and how that structure is made. You, you said you were on the uh, planning commission for six years. Yes. And um, that, that has to be quite an education in itself. It is. Yeah. Um, how are, what, what are the hot topics right now in the planning commission? Well, I, you know, it's, uh, it's project driven. So it's the folks that are coming in front of us. Right. Um, and, um, you know, the one we've got coming up here next is, uh, we've had it on the calendar once, uh, we've sent it back, uh, it'll be on uh, tomorrow, is the, uh, the apartment complex that's being proposed for uh, the town center mm. and, and add some uh, residential component to that, to that uh, conceptual downtown area that right. they've been working on for the last uh, 15, 20 years. Um, that's a controversy because it's a separate entity inside of it, it's a separate building inside of it. What does that do to traffic? Does it help traffic? Does it hurt traffic? Um, you know, these are the conversations that we need to, that we continue to have. And development has to pay its own way and has to do those, the improvements necessary. Um, are these projects too big? Are they too, you know, seldom does anybody say they're too small, but are <laughs> they too big, right? Right. Um, so being able to figure out all the, uh, the mitigations and the impacts and, and what does it take to make that project a very a, a balanced project that would allow for a seamless incorporation into the community with the least amount to no impact on the on the neighbors is always the ongoing challenge in this and when we when we talk about items in front of the planning commission you know I always see and hear you know and I hate to say that but we get people moving up from Southern California from the Bay Area and and as soon as they get here they automatically want change and um, I, I think one of the important things for those of us who have been here 30 40 years or even born here is that part of what attracted us to El Dorado County is still the rural feel of it so we we don't want to lose that at the same time we understand that we need a need to house people and and have that as well that's got to be one of the one of the items yeah, absolutely that we can talk about absolutely yeah we're um one of the things i'd like to see us spend more time on is uh some strategic planning mm -hmm. um we had a general plan, you know, we, we passed the general plan, it was voted on, it was passed by the, by the, by the residents, the citizens, and um, I'm not sure the county was fully prepared to implement that general plan. Um, that was a question that was asked frequently. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know it, there's nothing general about the general plan, and do we have the resources necessary? Right. Well, we're, we, have, we have finally gotten to the point where there's a long-range planning group their role is to help us implement the general plan and so the next phase of that is how do we take advantage of the tools that have been developed uh, by this group and as part of uh, analysis and turn that into more of a strategic plan you know how can we what we don't want to see is you know a thousand homes put in one spot yeah okay but we do there are ways to put them in in smaller units there's ways to cluster there's ways to to embrace the rural character without necessarily uh, paving it over, as everyone likes to use the <laughs> phrase. Right? We're not going to pave over the county. It's it's not going to happen. The plan doesn't allow for that. But we have to have a lot more thoughtful discussion and a lot more um, 
process is put in place to develop that strategic plan mm -hmm. so that we can so we can ask the right questions and the board knows how to ask those questions and the information is being provided freely as opposed to extracting it right uh, one question at a time right right <clears throat> well that, okay so that that's pretty interesting let's go and look at the county as a whole now um, so we're being told uh, you know the budget looks great. We're we the near term everything looks nice. Uh, we're kind of in the black. Some of the things are going along smooth, but there's an elephant in the room that nobody seems to want to talk about, and I suppose you can guess what that is. Okay, you want me to guess what that is? Guess what it is. We're, we're talking about uh, unfunded liabilities. Yeah, unfunded liabilities and retirements and in that that's going to be facing us here very soon. Yeah, we have to. Th there's been some progress on that front, in that there, you know, people that are starting now in the county have a different program than the ones that have been working there for True. the last t ten or twenty years. Right. Um, so there is a, there's a step in the right direction there. This is an overriding government problem everywhere. It's it, it affects the cities, it affects the counties, state, and at the federal level. How are we going to we're going to pay for what has been committed and promised? You know, I think unfortunately. Uh, you know, we're not going to be able to set the tone. We, as an Eldorado County, are not going to be able to set the tone necessarily on that front. Uh, there's court cases going on right now, Stockton, San Bernardino, and I think that this will these will become Detroit. Mm -hmm. is another oh one, yeah, absolutely. Right. So these will become uh, the bellwether uh, rulings that will allow the next level of uh, conversation to occur to say, look, we, there is a burden and there is a responsibility and it's not equal to, to other financial obligations. And how do we start trying to create some balance on that? Um, you know, it affects the fire departments, it affects the county, it affects the school boards. It, it, it affects everybody. Right. So um, that's gonna, we're gonna have to sort of wait and see how things unfold. We've done a little bit in that direction, but there's yeah. a lot more that needs to be happening. And unfortunately, we're not gonna be the driver on that one. Yeah, um, although I, I do wanna see the board that moving forward really start addressing these issues. I know it's been brought up, and sometimes it's it's a political issue that it's brought up, but it's a reality that we're, that we're facing. And, and uh, we're gonna have to figure out, like you said, all, all those other areas in California, Michigan, and other places, you know, we're going to have to figure out how they're going to fund those those uh, liabilities, and, and that's very difficult. And that leads me into the next question. One of the things I get, you know, as I go throughout the county and go into different county uh, facilities is our county facilities. Uh, we have some real serious problems in some of the, uh, some of the buildings we have now. Uh, you know, may it be the... Um, Senior Nutritional Center and, and all everything over mm -hmm. there to the uh, Sheriff's Department mm -hmm. to uh, everything else that folds into taking care and planning and management of our facilities. <clears throat> and, excuse me, and I know that due to the constraints of uh, the income that's been coming in and or lack thereof, I know a lot of def maintenance has been deferred. It has. And and how do we address that? We're well. We're. Some of the maintenance has been deferred, and some of it's just uh, keep outsourcing the the complex, right? I mean, we're up to what eighteen or nineteen hundred employees in the county now, mm -hmm. and and it's impossible to house them in a in a single facility or even a complex. I mean, we have the good news is we have a complex. The bad news is is that some facilities are completely overrun. I mean, the sheriff is located spread all over Creation, and. You know, there's some benefits to certainly having and management efficiencies that can happen mm -hmm. because of having a common facility, and the discussions are underway on that one. Um, but I and I think his approach, I think uh, Sheriff uh, D'Agostini's approach of saying it's a 50-year, let's look at this as a 50-year investment, is the right way to go. I mean, people will 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 criticize the the dollars spent on that right now, but if you have a 50-year plan and a facility that can accommodate that, I think that's a better use of money than to trying to keep cobble something together. Right. And we've been doing a lot of that. And we've been doing a lot of that. And we've been yes. doing a lot of that. So we have, <coughs> this has to go part of that strategic planning. We need to say, well, look, this becomes obsolete, right? Mm -hmm. Or can we do the overhaul and upgrade mm -hmm. um, and, and, and make the facilities more, uh, more approachable? But you're right. A lot of these uh, secondary uh, rental facilities have been... Uh, 
are dubious at this stage of the game, and we need to have something that's a little more a little more centralized, a little more accessible. Yeah, I think so. I think there's some good. Hopefully, the decision, particularly on the sheriff's facility, is decided fairly soon. Because if anybody takes a tour of that building, uh, you wouldn't want to work in there. No, no, it's 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 pretty bad. Well, I, and one. I was in there. I was in there within the last couple of weeks because I have to get the sheriff to sign off on uh, fundraising activities. Oh, sure. If you have if you're serving alcohol, mm -hmm. and so yeah, there's. I mean, it's all jammed in there. There, it's not. It's yeah. not a good thing. It's huh? not a good thing. It's not a good thing. And it's not good on the morale either. No. So, yeah. And so let's let's jump into another area that we we have a lack thereof, shall we say, and that's <coughs> jobs. How do we attract jobs into El Dorado County? And, and, you know, we've got this beautiful business park down there in El Dorado Hills. It's still mostly vacant. Um, how do we go about taking all that area and attract businesses in the, in the El Dorado County? Yeah, I think we're going to have to go after this a little bit differently than, uh, than what most people have been thinking about. Um, we're... Um, you know, we have a jobless recovery going on, and that's a federal level and a state level. Um, there's some urban areas that are that are showing signs of life and some activity. But in order to attract, you know, there is no silver bullet. There's no there's no intel that's going to come rolling in the door, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, and, 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 unfortunately. and, yeah. and the 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 deal that would be required to make it happen. It's going to be there's going to be a breaks and in financial incentives and, and tax relief and there's a lot of things that go into it right. and I'm not sure that that is going to be the answer for us in the long term, but we have to start small and start working our way back up. Um, we need to have we need to encourage uh, more entrepreneurs to get back into the marketplace. Mm -hmm. We're going to need to try to get our businesses that are that are surviving to start thriving, and a lot of that comes back down to the whole uh, keep it local. The, the chambers have been talking right. about keeping right. it local, but the part that's lost in that equation is that not only is it the sales tax dollars that benefit the county, but that money spent is also goes into the pocket of the local businesses, and that means jobs. So if we can have if if we can have small businesses add one more employee, right? If we save a hundred million dollars and ensure that that is spent in the county as opposed to out of the county and, and in Tahoe's case out of the state. Um, and spent locally, you know, we can create thousands of jobs just by keeping it, keeping our business local. And so we're going to have to grind at it that way. We have about 15,000 um, sole proprietors uh, in the county. Those are those folks are making a living wage. Mm -hmm. They are f for themselves. I mean, I'm I would be considered I'm a, I'm a small corporation, but I would be considered a small business and as, and and I employ my wife and myself sure it comes out of it right, right. but if, if business grows and I can add one more person to, to handle the tasting room or help me in the crush pad mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be um, hey that's one more person that's working I mean our functional unemployment rate in the South County in, in my neighborhood is probably between 20 and 25 percent I mean that's a lot I mean that's so lot. so yeah. so one job at a time is is kind of the methodology um, we want to encourage people to get back into the marketplace, start their businesses, start building some of that critical mass so that we can, uh, we can start moving forward. But it's, there is no silver bullet. We're going to have to work hard, and it's going to be at the, at the ground level. So when you say we're going to have to work hard, um, how do we go about, how does the county now go about attracting uh, businesses in, in the Illinois? Well, we've, we've, uh, we've only recently added first time in maybe three or four years that we have someone in charge of economic development. Mm -hmm. We have, that's been a, a, a void that we've had uh, at the county staffing level. Mm -hmm. So now there's actually a person working with a commission focusing on these type of discussions in collaboration with the chambers and, and other uh, associations in the county. Now we have someone leading the parade and we need to do everything we can to support that person mm -hmm. so that we can start putting together a plan and start executing it. Um, I mean, the, the, it's going to be easy to measure. Are we creating jobs or we're not creating jobs? And what does the unemployment rate look like? I mean, it's going to be real simple as to yeah. whether we're doing the job that we're supposed to be doing or not. Well, we know right now we're not. Our, oh, that's our, right. We yeah. know we're not. We know we're not. Our, uh, unemployment level is just way too high. And I guess my question is, is, is the county willing to... You know, you hear of states like Texas and other places. They come into an employer, 
They go, look, you know what? We'd like you to relocate. We'll pay for your move. We'll pay for the roads. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll give you a break on, uh, on your taxes for 10 years. Uh, same thing with your sewer and water hookups. Does our county have an opportunity to, uh, you know, basically give some sugar to these companies that are saying, hey, we're going to sweeten the pot so to make your decision easier here? You know, and this is where we have, this is part of the, this is part of that planning process that we need to figure out. Can we afford to do those type of things? There's a cost that comes with it. And, and, and some folks are critical saying that you're picking winners and losers when you go that path. But you know what? If, if we're competing with three other counties, let's, I mean, for example, UC Davis wants to put a, a satellite campus on this side of Sacramento. Right. All right. So we're going to be competing with Placer. We're going to be right. competing with, with Sacramento County. And, and we should be in that conversation too. But um, so I suspect everyone's gonna figure out how they can sweeten the pot and how they can do those things. But we need to have some, some boundaries and some critical analysis as to say, what is the economic impact of having that over the next 20 years? Mm -hmm. and, and what is the payback model and can we benefit from it? Sure. And so there's gonna be limits to what we can do. I mean, Sacramento County is gonna be in a better position, I think, than we are because they got a larger population base and a bigger funds, more, more funds and more latitude inside of their total budget than we do, right? Well, a lot of their infrastructure is already there, and that's their advantage versus some of the issues that we, we face here. But, you know, I always like, you know, I hear that statement, oh, we got to make sure that they pay us back. If we're going to do the sweet in the pot, you know, the fact is, is if you do attract um, a, a company, good sized company, let's say it hires 25 people. Uh, in 10 years, with the amount of money that that person's going to spend in the county between eating, residence, car, fuel, everything else that you add up, it'll be paid for. It does. There's economic escalators, that is a, is a phrase that's used, and it's how many times is that dollar spent over and over again in the exactly. county. Exactly. Right. And um, it enhances, when you, when you have those type of projects, you've improved uh, property values, uh, you've created a market for uh, and a need for housing to occur. Mm -hmm. You have, it's the jobs first and the housing to follow. Um, you have to figure out the price points of those employees. They're, you know, they're making money, they're paying their sales tax. And if, but we still have to keep that, those dollars in the county. And, and that's the hard part. We have to start changing our spending habits in order to keep the money in the county as much as possible and, and start building that sustainable employment base. Right. Because the more people are commuting back to Sacramento, the more chance they're going to be spending money in Sacramento. You know, a small example for me is um, when I moved up here, there was always a Ford store in El Dorado County. We lost our Ford store about five years mm -hmm. ago or so. And the number one selling truck in the United States is the F-150. And, and we have no Ford store in El Dorado County. And yeah. it just drives me crazy. How can we be missing out on those tax dollars? How can we be missing out on people having to travel that corridor down to another Ford store in another county to do basic maintenance? I, you know, if I was this economic de development person, that's certainly one of the areas that I would look at, try to get in here. Uh, absolutely. And you take a look at, um, I mean, look, I mean, they're going to Folsom. I mean, this is, no one wants to be Folsom, but everyone goes to Folsom, right? right. right. And so you have the, uh, so you have the, the big auto mall that's set up there. Mm -hmm. um, we're not set up that way. I mean, we have a dealership here, a dealership there. Right. And, right. and so we're not creating the synergy that needs to be, that needs to be there. So someone can do their price point shopping and go right. from point to point to point. Right. So I think there's, I think there's an opportunity to say, where would we put one of those, uh, a facility like that? And, and how can we encourage all the participants to, to join in and, and, and play in that sandbox in the same spot? Um, you know, this is, this is an overriding theme across the board on retail in general. Right. You know, we have to have, we have to create a little critical mass in order to allow support businesses and uh, complementary businesses to, to, to grow around them. And right. uh, we, need right. to, we need to pick a spot. It probably is, you know, you look at Shingle Springs as kind of a hub, and, yeah. you, and you allow people to uh, bring things up and down, right. uh, you know, from from the bottom of the hill to the to the top of the hill, um, you know, that might be a logical spot somewhere in there, Cameron Park to Shingle Springs, but no one's approached us with a with an opportunity to do those things. That's the second part of it. You know? Well, you got to have someone willing to pursue it as a, a from a development perspective. You know, uh, hopefully this economic development individual um, 
has the savvy to understand how you go about to attract business in yes. Colorado County. That's what we're hoping for. Because I could talk to this person right now and say, how you know, I can tell you how to get a Ford store in here, right? And yeah. that's and that's what we need. Um, uh, and, and jobs are critical. Now, our millennials, our yes. 30s, 40s years, year old people, where are they going to majority? Where is the majority of them going for, to work? Down in Sacramento, Sacramento so right? Down in Sacramento. So you know, so we, we're creating this traffic jam. We're not, uh, you know, we're not using the best use of our facilities and what we're bringing here. Uh, I know very few people in that age group that's able to make a career, right, in El Dorado County, unless of course you go to work for the county, and that's not necessarily the way we want it to go. Right. I mean, the whole idea is let's be uh, entrepreneurs and let's start our own business and hire these people. And, and don't get me wrong, you know, for those out there, we do have some n n companies, some pretty neat companies out there doing things like submarines, and uh, I mean, there's all kinds of pretty pretty crazy businesses out there so we have an express right there's yeah. another one that's kind of a interesting high-tech kind of company well I, yeah. you know the interesting part about that conversation is i'm not convinced that we have you know what our population is from those millennials i mean mm -hmm. we're when you when you take a look at uh when you take a look at our housing what we've built what's the inventory available uh the the part that we're not addressing at this stage of the game is that um what they're calling moderate income levels. Right. And, and in El Dorado County, moderate isn't that moderate. I mean, it's we're looking at eighty or ninety or ninety-five thousand dollars a year. Yeah. I mean, when you got twenty-five percent unemployment, that's all, in yeah. spots. Okay, eighty yeah. or ninety-five thousand dollars a year is a lot of money, a lot I mean, of as money. a household income or as an individual. So, but we're not we're not prepared to have those folks live here in the long haul. I think this is our this is one of our voids. Um. We have to be able to, to attract the next generation to, to bring their kids in. Mm -hmm. We see a shrinking school population. Um, the, all the numbers are over the 10 years are going down. And that's a sign of us having an aging population. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's it's people looking to buy their first homes or whether it's uh, f folks that are getting uh, older, and we do have that you know top three, top three oldest uh, counties in the state, and they're looking to downsize from, right. from where they're at into something more manageable so they can travel or do cruises or whatever they would like to do or not be held hostage to their property. Um, we don't have that price point. This is a huge void. And so this is the, the conversation is the chicken and the egg. Right. Do, you have, do, you get, do you have the housing that would accommodate those type of folks moving, moving up and moving down in, in, their, uh, in their lives as far as uh, economics go? Do you have that first, or do you have the jobs first? And and which one drives the which one drives the engine? Sure. The answer is you kind of have to do both. both. The, you have to do both at the same time. Right. So that's part of that strategic planning I keep talking about. We have to start thinking about where they are, how we can do it, and if it's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars in permits before you can build the first house, we're probably not going to make that. We're not going to be able to build that house for two hundred fifty thousand dollar price point that would be the attractive, attractive point for people to get started in. Uh, on their way to home ownership. Well, you opened the door. What about Tim fees? Um, I think that at an in, there's been kind of a two tiering approach has take been taken on in the last uh, twelve to eighteen months. I think it needs to be more. I think it needs to be more dramatic and more substantial than that. I mean, uh, you know, if someone buys ten acres in uh, in the Somerset area and puts a house on it, I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure that a twenty thousand dollar uh, traffic impact fee is really appropriate. I mean, it's a couple cars and a few trips, and 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 those are barriers to entry into the marketplace. Right, right. Um, when we start putting larger units together, I think we have to start taking a look at larger development. Um, we have to take a look at the size of them, and I think there's a I think there needs to be a mass f uh, escalation factor on there too, because if you put if you put in 20 homes versus putting in 200 homes. Um, I think the collective difference between the two is is significant. So um, we need to evaluate that and have a better plan on the TIM fees. We have really high traffic impact fees. Mm -hmm. We do. And and the, the the funny part about it is is that we didn't start doing traffic impact fees until 1990. And and even then it was in <laughs> El Dorado Hills. It was in El Dorado Hills. It was for the villages, and it was $600. We're talking in El Dorado Hills now. I believe we're up over over thirty thousand yeah, dollars. Yeah. You know, so, 
So we're playing catch up, I think, is part of what the problem is. Um, and we have to figure out a way to kind of balance all that. Yeah, you know, in in the again market, more balance. You yeah, know, it's, like, it's hard, the, but we got to have we got to start engaging in conversation on it. Right? I think so, and, and I think the the whole scope of things has kind of flushed itself out, so to speak. I mean, the, we, we've got these homes, we've got these million dollar homes in Serrano, and and then we go all the way down, and and the, as they learned, there's not the jobs to support those houses. So now we're losing uh, uh, taxes. Uh, you know, we're not getting property taxes in. Those people aren't uh, uh, aren't buying locally at the store. They're not paying for their gas. They're not. So we have a whole series of problems with that as far as price point goes. And and it's true. I know why. I know why I came up here. I came up here to raise my kids out of the city. Right. You know, we've lost a lot of that. I talked to some of the younger millennials, and it's going well. You know, I can't get a job here. How can I move here? And, and it's understandable. How can you? It's a, it's a very difficult situation. And, and, they, and they also want things, too. It's, it's not just, it's, it's more than just the job. They want services. They've got, you know, if, if they're here and they've got kids, they need to be able to, they want to take them to dance lessons. They want to take them to sure. karate classes. Sure. Right. You know, they, families now are different than they were when, when I was a kid, right? right. I mean, right. I lived in the country. You know, the, my biggest activity was I played Little League Baseball in the mm -hmm. summertime, and I had to ride my bike 10 miles to mm -hmm. go do that. Um, that's not the way it is. Everyone's got their kids busy and everything all the right. time. And so you got to have all those other pieces to go with it, too. And there, that's where the drive for, for new and different, as opposed to just keeping everything the same as it always was. Right. It, it's, it is that next generation that's going to want different things because they're used to coming out of a suburban environment, and they want to be able to have... They want to be able to have the, the, the niceties that go with having a rural lifestyle and being on two acres and seeing trees and grass right. and fields and animals. Right. But that doesn't mean that they won't want their kids to go do things, too. Right. Jonathan? I was going to ask, what to you is the most important issue facing El County? I don't know. Is there one issue that really stands out? So ah. Jonathan, our, produ our producer here, asked the question, is there one major item facing the county? We have a lot of them. <laughs> but I think I, I think we have a lot of them, and this is why we got to keep working on it. But I really do believe that it all hinges back on the local economy and the jobs. We have to we have to create a sustainable community. Um, accepting a status as a bedroom community is not a sustainable it's not a sustainable uh, program in my mind. Um, you know, I mean, if you if you want to go to the wayback machine, um, you know, I mean, Placerville. You lived in Placerville, you lived near Placerville, you drove into town and worked in Placerville. Well, that's okay when you're when you're around Placerville, but we have other little towns that right. are around here too. Right. We need to be able to create that concept and create the town concepts back again in order for us to, to, uh, to move forward. And it, it's jobs and it's the local economy. How can we be how can we be our own identity, not someone else's identity? Exactly. You know, and one of the other things, and we're going to wrap this up pretty quick here, but one of the things that gets me is uh, taxes that are named fees. And uh, it, it just yeah. drives me crazy. It's a tax, guys. It's a and, tax. <laughs> well, so let, let's use this fire tax that's out there now that, uh, that we're being held hot hostage to. We don't have a choice. We have to pay these fire taxes. Do you, is that the right avenue to go? Well, those, that, <laughs> that has created a load of unintended consequences. Um, you know, they, draw the, they drew the line at the, at the county line. So El Dorado right. Hills is paying this tax too. Sure. Um, and it's also affecting, our insurance companies are looking at it saying, oh, you're in a high fire zone because we have to have a special, uh, a special fee, a special right. tax on it because you're so, it's so dangerous there. Insurance rates are going through the roof. If you can get renewed, people right. are get losing their insurance policies right now, and when they're getting the next one, it's costing them a couple thousand dollars more. Right. There's it was loaded with this is classic government overreach, and um, the money was supposed to be used for for outreach in the communities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always said that we would be better served if they took that money and they did four hours of quality work on my property to remove a fire hazard <laughs> than doing their outreach. I mean, there's a whole bunch of us that could use some help out there. Absolutely. Right? And take that money and apply it universally because it protects everybody. Um, but now some of that money is starting to come back in the form of uh, form of grants 
and it's, it could be an opportunity for the fire safe councils to get started. Um, we have to have some small amounts of money to, to, to match in, inside of that. But if those, if those dollars come back in the community for what is the full analysis, um, how many you know, unoccupied parcels do we have out there? I mean, we're looking at this in Pleasant Valley right now. Right. You know, probably a quarter of the parcels do not have a house on it. Are they even ro remotely being maintained? Much less fire safe around exactly. the structure, right? Yeah, right. So, um, so there's a chance for this to start coming back. But uh, you know, we're in a we're in one of the most regulated states in the country, and, and my overriding philosophy is: why are we doing anything more than what state law is? Unless there's something very unique and very specific to El Dorado County that yeah. would be different than what the state would have to say. There's so many on the state levels. There's so many issues. I don't even get started there. But um, uh, I have this this philosophy, and I want I want the legislators to do this. Every time they want to write a bill and pass a bill, two has to come off the books. I, I agree. You know, this is ridiculous. We you know we can't keep writing these laws that don't do, do no good. Um, well, they always require someone to do something somewhere at, at the expense of something else. If you're adding seven or eight hundred new laws a year, yeah. someone's doing something. Right? Yeah. That, uh -huh. that's ex it's expansion of the government, and it's expansion of the government typically at the higher level, not at the front line level where the government needs to be the most responsive. Exactly. Yeah. Um, no. Exactly. And then I, the, you know, uh, uh, nobody. It's no, no surprise to anybody out there. I'm a big Second Amendment guy. Mm -hmm. And and. and how do you how do you feel about the, the Second Amendment? Where do you stand on that? I'm uh, all in favor of the Second Amendment. I uh, I support uh, the sheriff's uh, expansion of uh, CCWs. Uh, you know, r rural living is a little bit different, and we're not going to get the response times out there. It's it's just a fact of life. Right. He's working hard. He's got a program. We're having regular patrols out there, but. Um, and there's a chance for a substation in the South County, just like they've put a substation up on a divide. Right. But he's trying to prepare us to to uh, to help ourselves, and mm -hmm. and I support the Second Amendment. And I support mm -hmm. the his, his program for the CCWs. Good deal. I uh, I really appreciate that. And I, you know, I keep telling people you need to educate yourself and read a little bit of history. And uh, I say that at almost every every show. You know, just go read some stuff on World War II and what took place in Germany in 1935. And then you'll start seeing some parallels, and it, it scares me. But this is about you, so let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about it. We're, get, we're, we're getting close to wrapping up. Let's just, let's talk about now. Do you have a website? We have a website. It's uh, prattforsupervisor dot com. Okay. okay, excellent. I'm out there on Facebook too. Yeah, yep. And Absolutely. we're taking donations. And we are taking. There is a contribute button on my website. There you so. go. There we go. We like that. Number four or F O R. F O R. Yeah. Good. The number four is for the for the clever folks that are in District Four, but for for those of us that are not, I'm yeah. I'm, I'm I'm going the conventional route. That's right. That's probably the smart way of doing it. Confuse everybody exactly. if you use that number. Exactly. And of course, if you're watching Old Guy Tech TV, we really need those donations. That we're a small business here, and if we're going to stay in business, we need some help. So we're one of those small businesses that are struggling as well. So Dave, do you have any final words you want to say to anybody? I would. Uh, I would ask. For Everyone take a look at my track record. They would take a look at uh, my experience. They would take a look at what I've identified as, as issues and uh, and vote for me, please. There you go. Respect, respectfully ask for the vote. Get out there and vote. And I don't care what happens, get out and vote. And I know there's some disenfranchised voters out there. And i got to tell you guys, if you look at our last uh, general election in El Dorado County that took place, and you look at the how poor the turnout is, you got to be ashamed of yourselves. That's the way I feel. And special elections are typically lower yeah. uh, lower turnout. I, I would like to think that we could uh, reverse that trend here in El Dorado County because the more people that vote, the everyone's had a chance to have their say. Absolutely. And and this is a, a kind of a short, compact race with a single item on the ballot. There's no reason for people not to vote. Exactly. No reason not to vote. Vote absentee if you just can't make it to those polls. And you know what? We need to keep El Dorado County strong, and we need your opinion as well. Dave, thank you very much for coming thank, in and thank seeing you, us. Rob. It Absolutely. was a great time. Hopefully those of you out there got a chance to see Dave a little bit, and I asked the right questions. And if I didn't, shoot me some more questions, and I know how to get to Dave. We're, we're friends on Facebook, so there you we go. can take care of that. Anyway, once again, this is Rob with Old Guy Tech TV. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.